Thank you very much. Um, our final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion 15408 in the name of Gil Patterson on health issues raised by aircraft noise. Could I suggest that any member who wishes to speak in this debate presses their request to speak button and I call on Gil Patterson to open the debate. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Can I start, Presiding Officer, by saying, uh, put on the public record, my thanks to Tam Brady, Joe Henry, Reuben McLean, Pat Hoy and Adam Garnick. These folk have been beside me for the last 12 years helping me on uh, aircraft noise issues. Uh, and due to holidays and a few unforeseen things, they were expected, to, some of them to be expected in the gallery tonight, but unfortunately they couldn't be here. Presiding officer in 2007 and 2000, 2009, I conducted two extensive surveys into the effects on individuals who lived under the flight path of Glasgow Airport. Not surprisingly, I had a high return. Many of the com comments were in regards to ill health and the respondents were convinced that their condition was down to the noise from aircraft. Much research since then has been carried out by my office, most of which confirms the fears of my constituents that noise from aircraft indeed det is and detrimental for people's health. One of my research projects conducted in 2014 was a comprehensive undertaking, 30, 32 pages long, which covered the causes the extent of how, how widespread it affected, what damage was being done, what compensation was involved elsewhere, who was responsible for action, and most importantly, what can be done to alleviate the impact. I presented this report to Glasgow Airport seeking dialogue with a view to see if there was any elements in the report that we could, could constructively work on. I'm pleased to tell the Chamber to say that the airport agreed to meet me. One of, the, mode, the, of the, the major ongoing complaints was being kept awake at night by flights in the wee small hours. There are no restrictions to flights at Glasgow Airport uh, through the night. My ask of the airport, which I put to Amanda McMillan, the then Chief Executive, was a request that the airport carry out a pilot scheme to insulate houses to protect against the noise that would allow for a night's sleep. The airport said they would consider this, but thought it would not be possible to retrofit a house at a reasonable co cost that would make this a viable proposition. I took up this challenge, and again, after much research this time into the process, I re-retrofitted re a house in Clyde Bank and in a attempt to, pr to prove it could be done economically. In September 2016, I commissioned Sonoflow Limited, a specialist condition monitoring company owned by Reuben McLean, to professionally monitor the noise outcomes. He produced me, uh, for me a nighttime aircraft survey. The mon monitoring went through four distinct phases over a week. First, a sound test inside the house was carried out with no added insulation, which measured 63 decibels. Then the loft was insulated. A further test measured 50 decibels, after which triple, triple glazing was fitted and a further test measured 45 decibels. The outside of the house was measured at 84 decibels. And although the house was already equipped with double glazing, a major difference was achieved by installing triple glazing. The significance of three decibels, presiding officer, is that three decibels is a doubling of the sound value. Three is double or three is half, depending what ways you measure. When I presented the findings to Glasgow Airport, the airport accepted the findings and the quality of the work that had been done by this professional. After a few meetings, to their credit, the airport came good with their promise and said they would be prepared, they would prepare the details of a pilot scheme. In the intervening period, a directive was issued by the UK government to the effect that airports 
with noise levels of 63 decibels and above will be required to put in place a sound reduction scheme for the, all those houses affected. This means that some 50, 500 to 800 houses will now be eligible in Clydebank. This, of course, overtook the voluntary scheme and will de deliver way above my own expectations. It should be noted the UK government has have just this week finished an Aviation 2050 consultation on aircraft noise with a proposal to re reduce the levels before compensation by a further three decibels to 60 decibels. Yeah, of course. Bill Findlay. Of, a point of clarity, you mentioned that it would no longer be a, a, a voluntary scheme. So is this a compulsory scheme? Because my understanding is that there are no compulsory schemes. Gil Patterson. Well, uh, absolutely. Uh, what you've just described is the case. The voluntary scheme has been taken over by a, a mandatory scheme. And as long as the, the households are inside measurement is above 63 decibels spread, spread over 16 hours, then they'll qualify it. And to, you know, I'm pleased that obviously what I was going to accept was a, a smaller number, but having that number is, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for it. Neil Findlay. Well, that, the, um, I wonder if you could just explain further how that works. I take it um, the householder has to apply to the scheme. Do they have to make a contribution? Is 100% of the cost covered? Um, I, because I'm, this is new to me and I'm really uh, interested in what the member is saying. Gil Patterson. I, unfortunately, I'm not able to say that because the scheme has presently been developed and I, 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 I don't know the full extent and that's why I'm not sure if it will be 500 or 800, but it'll be somewhere in between. As, as to how it will apply, I, I'm not entirely sure. If I find it, I'll certainly keep you posted. It's a bit of an anarchic uh, issue in many cases if you don't have to put up with this. So I'm, I'm glad you're interested in that and I'll, I'll do my best to keep you informed. I've also been engaged with the, the Scottish Government, Western Barnshire Council and Eastern Barnshire Council, although neither, neither the Scottish Government nor local authorities have little or no powers uh, over aviation. My discussions with Western Barnshire Council was to encourage them whenever they were involved in fuel poverty projects where they typically install double glazing, loft insulation and wall, wall insulation by suggesting that in areas under flight path that are affected by noise, that for a very small additional outlay, the, mid, the materials used should be materials that protected for both heat loss and sound penetration. And it should be noted that the materials that I used in my experiment were excellent in both capacities. You may, ask if the Scottish uh, you may ask if the Scottish Government and local authorities have no responsibility for this issue, why they should spend a penny on reserve matters. Then I need to point out to the warnings over many years from the World Health Organization who have highlighted the hazards caused by aircraft noise. The list, latest of these warnings from the World Health Organization came in October 2018, raising the prospect of a cardiovascular a disease, cogn a, a cognitive Im impairment, quality of life well-being and mental health issues, metabolic outcomes and more. Therefore, the costs met by the Scottish and local governments would, for a mod modest additional cost, by taking preventative action and upgrading their vital and welcome fuel poverty schemes under the flight path, they will save untold expend, uh, expenditure in the future. And people, particularly children, will be protected and able to flourish. Excuse me a second. I'm pleased to say my many constructive, constructive talks with the Scottish Government, in particular the minister that's sitting here, Kevin Stewart, uh, and Western Blackshire Council are bearing uh, some fruit. There is a proposal going forward uh, before Western Blackshire Council in August to approve a second pilot scheme retrofitting 12 houses for heat and sound protection. The World Health Organization say that, say that people are damaged at levels over 45 decibels. 
Therefore, I believe that housing res regulations for new build homes, which are within this zone, and incidentally, this zone is identified on a public recorded document, that they be required to install materials that protect to the 45 decibels level. Of course, the cost of installing on a virgin housing site is considerably less than having to rip it out and reinstall uh, later on. So it's really interesting that right now in Clyde Bank, there are houses being built that fall within the 60 decibel zone, which if not fitted with dual heat sound protection products at the start, would be required to do so in a few short years. However, I'm glad to say West Dumbartonshire Council have been very engaged and alert in this matter, and there is every chance these houses will be fully protected to that secure level. To, to conclude, although this is very much a health debate, it could have easily been an education because of the damage to attainment. However, the remedy lies in all the cases in protecting the building. So my pres presiding officer, so my message from this debate is quite simple. You either stop nighttime flights, that's an option, or you insulate ho ho buildings and homes to safeguard the pe people. That's the solution to that, and I thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Patterson. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Rona Mackay. Mr. Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I uh, uh, thank uh, Gail Patterson for uh, bringing this deep debate forward um, this evening? And can I also thank him uh, for the information that he has shared um, already, which has been um, enlightening to me. Airports are a fantastic feature of any city bringing a huge wave of benefits to citizens both locally and nationally. They, they facilitate the travel of millions of people to hundreds of destinations while also improving the economy through tourism and, export, and exporting. For example, Edinburgh Airport has a hugely positive impact here on the Scottish economy. According to a recent study, the airport contributes nearly one billion to the Scottish economy every year supports 23,000 jobs nationwide. Its impact is wide ranging and must not be underestimated, providing the foundations for many of the Scottish industries, in particularly tourism. Tourism, particularly here for Edinburgh, but for the whole of Scotland, is a vital industry with over 14,000 businesses focused on tourism, catering towards the millions of visitors coming to our country each year. Visitors are attracted by our magnificent environment, our culture, but not forgetting golf, whiskey, and of course, the castle. Undoubtedly, it is important to be mindful that despite the incredible benefits, airports do have an effect on the surrounding environment. Noise is the concern at hand and is raised on occasion by communities along the airport flight paths. While noise cannot be completely removed, airports do wish to manage the impact on local communities. And I am delighted um, that we've already heard about what the UK government is doing and will do, and this will move it from a voluntary system into um, a statutory formation. Edinburgh Airport has, has had a noise action plan in place for 2018 to 2023 which has been created in order to engage with local communities around the issue of noise. The aim of the plan is to consult with local communities on how they may be affected by living under flight paths or near the airport. These cons consultations will give information which will help the airport to understand what are the specific issues affecting people and ultimately how best can it work with them to improve its impact, absolutely. Neil Finlay. I wonder if Mr Balfour is aware that the uh, expansion of flight paths at Edinburgh Airport has been rejected twice by the CAA because the airport has not provided the correct information to communities that we, uh, would be impacted by noise and other factors. Jeremy Balfour. Um, I am aware and have been involved in that process. I mean, I think we do have a challenge um, of when the aeroplanes take off, um, as Mr Finley will be aware, um, they have previously 
uh, gone in one direction and the airport had been suggesting that we go over other parts of West Lothian. And I think that has had an effect on local communities. And I do think the airport still needs to uh, come up with a system that allows uh, aeroplanes to land and take off in an efficient way, but also protects communities, particularly communities that have not been affected by that noise uh, previously to now. Um, picking up a point uh, by Mr Finlay, um, I understand that Edinburgh has now set up an independent noise management board, which has been made up of community councils and other airport stakeholders. And I do hope that that will engage with local communities um, across the Lovians. Ultimately, it is not possible to eliminate all noise generated from airports. And there must be a degree of give and take, especially given factors such as the varying levels of people's experience towards noise and how much the economic growth is generated by the airport. However, it is clear that airports across Scotland are taking this matter seriously. And again, I'm pleased of uh, Gail Patterson's examples at Glasgow. And I do hope that my local airport here in Edinburgh will follow that line of Glasgow and take this seriously and support local communities as best as we can. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Bath. I call Rona McKay to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to my friend and colleague, Gil Patterson, for bringing this important debate to the Chamber tonight. And I'd like to pay tribute to him for his long-standing work on this issue. I know that Gil has been working on this for more than a decade and has been relentless in his pursuit of justice for those living under the flight path of Glasgow Airport. And it's great to hear that um, finally success is, is round the corner. Um, Gill's outlined the more technical issues in the debate and the fact that the Scottish Government has no powers in relation to aircraft regulation as this is reserved to the UK Government. It also, also has very limited powers in relation to health and safety and it's those aspects uh, that I'd like to concentrate on tonight. Um, Gill has articulated many of the, the, health, the negative health aspects and, and everyone now accepts that excessive aircraft noise, particularly at night, has a negative impact on health. It can contribute to heart disease, strokes, high blood pressure, mental health issues in relation to constantly disturbed sleep due to night flights. We all know how bad we feel after a disturbed night's sleep for whatever reason. Think about enduring that every night and you'll begin to see the magnitude of the problem. One of the most depressing and unfair impacts in relation to noise is how it can affect children's cognitive development. The constant interruptions from overhead noise during school hours and during the night can adversely affect children's educational attainment. Presiding officer, aircraft noise doesn't uh, affect every household in Scotland. My constituency of Strathkelvin and Bearsden, which neighbours uh, Gil Patterson's constituency of Clydebank and Mogai, is on the flight path to and from Glasgow Airport. But there's no doubt that due to the proximity of Clydebank to the airport, Gil's constituency is most adversely affected. However, to put that into context, the World Health Organization guidelines recommend that over 40 DBAs are enough to adversely affect sleep and frequently noise has been recorded at over 50 and 60 DBAs in parts of Bearsden. Indeed, when the Civil Aviation Authority instructed Glasgow Airport to alter the flight pass last year, many of my constituents contacted me worried about the increase in noise pollution. Many of children sit in important exams or were university students concerned about the impact uh, the noise would have on their concentration and sleep. And when the airport organised a consultation day in Bears Den to illustrate the changes that were being planned, to the astonishment of the organisers, more than 400 people turned up over the course of the day. And that was far more than had turned up when they, they organised a Heathrow consultation. Um, Presiding officer, this is an issue which we must address and, and I'm really pleased to hear of the progress that's been made. Um, and it's, it's for the sake of those whose lives have been blighted by excessive noise and nighttime flights for many years. Gil Patterson has outlined ways in which this could be achieved and, and the progress has been made despite our limited powers. And, and I hope that this is, this is going to progress quickly for the sake of those who are living under the flight pass because we're talking about the health and well-being of future generations and it's our responsibility to act now so that this problem is dealt with before they too suffer the ill effects of excessive aircraft noise. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Mr Finlay, please. Thanks, President Officer, and uh, I congratulate Mr Patterson on his uh, debate. I brought forward a 
debate on the, the expansion of Edinburgh Airport flight paths uh, a few years back and uh, during that time uh, hosted a couple of public meetings in West Lothian where uh, we had a huge number of people attended very concerned about what the impact of uh, flight expansion would be uh, on them and their community because we know that uh, airports are an unhealthy environment, um, noise and stress and waste and fumes and overcrowding and all the rest of it uh, have a major impact on the environment and are, uh, you know, we know they're a significant contributor to pollution and global warming, yet they are of course very important to our economy and society and provide a lot of jobs <coughs> and most of us use air travel from time to time. So I think we have to look at how we are going to address these conflicting features of air travel. Um, the research from the World Health Organization sh um, recently, uh, the stuff that I read shows how some cities have joined what they call the Healthy Cities Movement, uh, who are trying to uh, bring airports and the local community together to create far more healthy places, um, places that can coexist in a much healthier way by reducing waste and offsetting and reducing emissions, uh, having sustainable travel to and from airports and mitigating noise. Uh, and I think that's how it has to be in the future. Uh, uh, um, and it's certainly, that is not my experience of uh, having dealt with Edinburgh Airport over the last couple of years or how the uh, senior management of the airport conducted themselves during the uh, process that I spoke about earlier. Um, airports are noisy places. Yeah. Gil Patterson. Yeah, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate what you say about airports. Uh, I've, I've, I've got the same thoughts myself, but I think there's a, a very much a political dimension. I don't come to this debate as someone that's uh, talking about the environment. I'm talking about people who are affected with their health. And if you consider the low number of people in comparison to the people that actually use Edinburgh Airport, Glasgow Airport, and other airports, it's a very small number, and I think it is feasible and possible to actually take care of them. Uh, and I think, I, I really believe the only way it can be done is with a political act. The UK government's doing it, but for me, they're doing it too slowly. They should look at the health, uh, the, 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 w, uh, the, the, the World Health Organization, and work to that order rather than salami slice it the way they're doing. Uh, Mr. Finley, you'll get your time back. I wouldn't, so that's I a long intervention. I wouldn't disagree with what uh, uh, Mr. Patterson says, but I'll come on to some of those issues in a minute. Um, the reality is airports are noisy places. Planes are big, noisy machines, and uh, their impact uh, impacts negatively on people in the community. And that extensive body of research that people have spoken about, about the impact of high levels of noise uh, uh, contributing to heart disease, um, the more you're exposed to it, the longer you're exposed to it, the higher your uh, risk of adverse health impacts. Um, we know that it impacts on the uh, learning capacity of children, on impacts on sleep disturbance, and has psychological impacts, contributes to obesity and low birth weight, and all of the other issues that um, there is a, quite a significant body of research on. But combining the noise with the increased air pollution from aircraft and from uh, road vehicles service in the airport, all of that compounds the impact on communities nearby. And there are things, there are things that can be done to reduce noise, ground noise, uh, you know, and, and actually noise in the air. Quieter engines are being developed. Electronic planes, I think, are not um, science fiction. They may be here sooner rather than later. Restrictions on night flights, as, as has been mentioned, and more sensitive scheduling of uh, flights, I think, is, is the correct way forward. Um, Countries have statutory schemes for the likes of the projects that Mr. Patterson uh, has spoken about. And I hope that this <coughs> is definitely becoming a statutory scheme, statutory scheme because what I've looked at at the moment is that this is a very patchy thing. It's up to the airport in that area to decide what happens. And statutory schemes in other areas are paid for ta by taxes and levies on travel. Um, and here that is not currently the case. So I hope that we are moving to that because certainly a number of the properties in uh, my region could would benefit greatly from that. In some countries, of course, they have property removal initiatives where actually the properties are bought up and people are compensated, and that's been done in places like the Netherlands, uh, but uh, uh, and, and to good effect. Um, and on the ground and ground noise, bins and noise walls have been constructed to help 
uh, with ground noise. But my experience of dealing with expansion of flight paths to Edinburgh was not a good one, and I have to say, neither was it good for the communities who would have been affected. Airports have to be upfront. They've got to be honest about what they're doing, and they've got to build relationships with communities. They should have done that prior to submitting their application to extend the flight paths and didn't. And I think it was a huge missed opportunity. They also need to end the professional arrogance. They actually came up against it in the campaign group that I worked with because we had a professor of aviation who joined the group. So any of the baffling science and engineering that they would throw at us was easily addressed because we had the good fortune to have a professor of aviation. Not all community groups have that luxury. Uh, they also need to respect their neighbours and provide real and genuine and live information on flights and the noise from them. Uh, the, as I said earlier, the airport proposal for expansion to Edinburgh has twice been rejected by the CAA because of the poor information that they provided for the community. They cannot do that. If we're going to have a credible way forward where communities coexist, then they have to provide genuine information and work collectively with the communities that are impacted. Thank you very much, Mr Finlay. I call Mark Ruskell, followed by Angus MacDonald. Mr MacDonald is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Ruskell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I join members in also uh, thanking Gil Patterson for his work on this issue over, over many, many years. Um, I mean, a number of members have already talked about the, the numerous studies that have been conducted that show that higher levels of aircraft noise can impact on high blood pressure, um, on heart disease, on heart attacks, on strokes, and, and even dementia. Uh, and of course, the educational impacts as well on, on children, whether it's uh, in the classroom or at home, the impacts on their reading, on their comprehension and memory skills have been, I believe, at least 20 studies that have been uh, done into this and looked at looking into this. And, of course, across the UK, I mean, you know, Mr. Patterson says it's a relatively small number. I mean, there are 60,000 people uh, who are exposed to nighttime aircraft noise which exceed those World Health Organization limits every single night. Um, so it's clear that noise from airports is causing a major public health crisis for those communities that are affected. And it is our responsibility in this parliament uh, to tackle it. Now, my constituents in Fife live under the shadow of existing and potential future flight paths out of Edinburgh Airport. From 2016 until October last year, the airport undertook an airspace change program, which ultimately <laughs> sought to double the number of planes taking off from the airport at peak times to a departure every single minute. Now, it proposed eight new arrivals paths, meaning nearly every community within a 15-mile radius, with the exception of central Edinburgh, would have a flight path overhead. Now, I was inundated, as, as Mr. Finlay and many other members were, with concerns. Uh, for me, in five stretching from Charleston in the west through to Dunfermline, Inverkeething, and Kinghorn in the east. And throughout the multiple consultations that have taken place, community concerns about noise were repeatedly downplayed and ignored by the airport. Residents felt the information and noise mapping provided was deliberately difficult to understand and didn't take into account the clear noise impacts within the home. Concerns were also raised by members of the airport's own noise advisory board as to the accuracy of the information that was provided. And it was clear to many of us that the airport saw concern about noise as an issue just to be swept largely under the carpet. Yes, it will give away it. Neil Finlay. Of course, I think the thing that uh, galled the community most was that the airport was not operating at capacity and there actually was no need for the expansion of flight paths. My opinion all along is that they are fattening the airport up for sale because the business model that the owners operate to is that they keep assets for a short period of time, then flog them on for huge profits. When they were challenged about that, they did not deny it. Mark yeah. Ruskell. No, that was raised at many of the uh, community meetings that we had in Fife, and it, it's clear that Edinburgh Airport, you know, it, it gains money from the flights, but also gains money from selling duty-free and its commercial operations as well. Um, now, the CAA uh, rejected the proposed new flight pass last October, uh, criticising the airport for increasing the proposed flight path numbers mid-consultation and then failing to properly engage with communities then on the impacts. And the rejection by the CAA was a, a major win for communities. But, of course, Edinburgh Airport have already begun the work to submit a fresh proposal for new flight paths. And this is why now more than ever we need to get a handle on tackling the noise issue. Now, 
Recent changes to regulations at UK level mean that we can finally take action here in Scotland on noise pollution from our airports. New regulations give Scottish ministers the power to introduce noise-related operating restrictions on all airports with over 50,000 civil aircraft movements per year. And I welcome the opportunity uh, earlier this year to meet with Transport Scotland officials, along with representatives from Dalgetty Bay and Hill End, Kinghorn and North Queensbury Community Councils. And I look forward to further guidance that is due to be published on this subject imminently. I hope it reflects their concerns, and I'd welcome an update from the Minister if he's able uh, to give us one this evening. Now, my colleague uh, Andy Whiteman and I have also spoken in this chamber before about the opportunity for ministers to have more control over the operating conditions through formal designation of Edinburgh Airport and the use of powers under the Civil Aviation Act. Now, this would allow us to address the issue of night flights from the airport, which are already restricted at Heathrow, Gatwick and Stansted. And last month in this chamber, the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson, also committed to reviewing the vast permitted development rights granted to airports, which can further contribute to expansion and related noise. I noticed Mr. Stewart was here earlier on. I mean, hopefully he'll go back and, uh, and think about the forthcoming review into permitted development rights and how we can get more control over uh, the airports. I mean, at the moment, they just have, seem to have vast, unlimited uh, permitted development rights within the curtilage uh, of, of the airport uh, and that of course can facilitate expansion and, and noise issues. So uh, presiding officer if we're all in agreement about the health impacts caused by noise from aviation there do appear now to be multiple ways that we could be addressing these in Scotland not just about insulating properties um, but actually going further and looking at uh, measured restrictions as well. And I look forward to working with colleagues from across the chamber to tackle this growing public health crisis. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Gil Patterson, for bringing this important issue before us for debate today, which can clearly have an impact on people's quality of life. Aircraft noise isn't a new issue. It's been a constant source of frustration for communities for a considerable period, and there is, in certain circumstances, no way of escaping it. So, uh, as members will be aware, in 2015, Edinburgh Airport embarked upon an airspace trial that saw aircraft use a new, newly designed flight path from takeoff, which sought to reduce the amount of fuel aircraft were burning while waiting on the runway, reduce the time between the departures of each aircraft, and provide a better service for passengers and the airlines flying from, <coughs> from the airport. This resulted in the unintended consequence of significant proportions of East Central Scotland now being overflown by jet and turboprop aircraft that previously weren't before. Now, areas within my own constituency, including Manorston Holdings and the village of Black Ness, were particularly affected, as too were swathes of my colleagues uh, Angela Constance and Fiona Hislop's constituencies of Almond Valley and Linlithgow, respectively. And of course, I acknowledge uh, the work that Neil Finlay's done on this particular issue too in West Lothian. Um, the vast majority of complaints were around the level of noise emitted by the aircraft. Given that one of the trial's aims was to reduce the time between takeoffs, there were also complaints about the number of jets using this new flight path <coughs> and causing untold stress and anxiety to residents in these areas. High-powered passenger jet aircraft breaking what was once tranquility and turning a peaceful life into a noisy nightmare in the process. Edinburgh Airport also operates, uh, as we've heard, a not insignificant amount of night flights. These are defined as flights between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning, and as recently as 2018, the airport has been facing calls to curb the amount of flights during this period. In July 2014, figures from one chosen week marked 138 takeoffs and landings at the airport. However, four years later, night flights had increased by 38% to 191 in the same week studied. That's 191 times per week that someone could have their sleep disturbed by the intrusion of aircraft noise. Presiding officer, we must consider that any sustained intrusion to our lives during the day or while we're asleep it can result in detrimental impacts on our health. Exposure to regular aircraft noise plays a large part in that intrusion for people living near air airports or under flight paths. And as Gil Patterson and others have referred to in this evening's debate, uh, the recent WHO report on environmental noise guidelines provides strong recommendations for achieving aircraft noise levels below 45 decibels during the day and below 40 decibels through the night. 
anything above these levels will have an adverse impact on the health of exposed populations. So turning to some of the findings of Edinburgh Airport's trial airspace change, if the average noise recorded in places across the flight path area were consistently above the 40 to 45 decibel threshold, and in some cases considerably above. In 2012, uh, Virgin Atlantic pledged to reduce noise energy output of its fleet by six decibels per aircraft movement uh, by 2020. This, in line with advancements in aircraft engine technology, is all very welcome. However, reducing noise by six decibels from a, an original level of about 70 decibels is still well above the recommendations of the WHO report. The Civil Aviation Authority, the European Union and uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization uh, should be working to ensure that policies are in place to continue innovation and mitigation wherever appropriate and possible to limit the impacts on our communities. In particular, it's for the CAA in the UK going forward to ensure that its procedures and guidelines are fit for purpose for airspace change and the changes in use of existing flight paths is appropriate and takes into consideration the impacts of communities as a priority. Although the changes proposed by the Edinburgh Airspace <coughs> Change were ultimately rejected, the communities subjected to the trial and subsequent changes in the use of other flight paths <coughs> are a long way from properly healing. So in closing, presiding officer, the WHO report should be taken very seriously if we are to ensure communities are given every chance to live in the relatively peaceful way they rightly deserve. However, it's incumbent upon all parties involved to be at the table to ensure progress in this area is made for everyone in the spirit of collaboration and collective responsibility that we all have towards our citizens and our communities. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms McDonald. I call on Paul Wheelhouse to close to the Government Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and to respond for the Scottish Government on behalf of the Cabinet Secretary and also recognise the strong feeling there is about this issue among some residents, as we've heard, in, in the communities that are affected by aircraft noise and, of course, members across the Chamber. I also recognise particularly the long-standing interest that, that Gil Patterson has in this issue and want to congratulate, congratulate him sincerely on securing time for this very important debate for his constituents and clearly for other uh, members across this chamber's constituents as well. I hadn't appreciated until sitting next to Mr Stewart was pointing out to me the example that was given that Gil Patterson had done a pilot project, I believe, if Mr Stewart is correct, was actually paid for at the expense of Mr Patterson, Patterson which is definitely going above and beyond the call of duty for MSPs, but I, th I think further adds strength to the commitment that um, Mr Patterson has shown to trying to resolve this issue for his constituents. I want to start, though, by referring to the WHO report. Uh, of course, the assessment of noise and noise uh, annoyance is a complex process, and different noise sources affect people in different ways, as we've heard. The issue of the uh, extent of health effects and the associate, associated with noise is an ongoing area of research, and the WHO report is an important contribution to our knowledge of the issue, as uh, Rona Mackay and uh, Angus MacDonald, uh, Gil Patterson and, and others have said, uh, the thresholds that have been established in the WHA report of um, 45 uh, decibels by day and 40 decibels at night are obviously very informative. The WHO report does, however, cover a number of areas, and it's worth while well, just mentioning that it also, in addition to aircraft noise, also covers issues associated with road traffic, uh, rail, wind turbines, and indeed leisure noise. But, presiding officer, as well as the impact of different noise sources in isolation, their interaction is also important. At any given point, individuals and indeed wider communities are likely to be exposed to noise from multiple sources simultaneously. Any efforts to mitigate the, against the impact of noise should take this into account and as context uh, for the issues of noise impacts, which I'll, I'll turn to shortly. Um, Jeremy Balfour alluded to, to this, but we're also debating this issue in part uh, due to the ongoing success of Scotland's airports. Uh, last week, Edinburgh Airport announced their, which has been referenced a number of times by speakers today, has, has announced their busiest re May on record. And Glas Glasgow Airport had their busiest ever year in 2017. And this is, of course, something that Scotland takes into account in terms of our climate change targets and actions to address climate change. I know members are concerned to manage that impact. And Scotland now has direct services, though, to many parts of the world, which we didn't have before, including the Middle East, to a range of destinations in North America, and to numerous cities across Europe that we rely on for doing business or taking family on holiday. But Edinburgh's newly launched service to Boston, which the Scottish Government assisted in securing, is further enhancing Scotland's route network and, of course, um, can eliminate unnecessary connecting flights to hub airports. But that doesn't diminish the concern that I know members uh, feel about the issue of noise. 
And while, as I, I say, I recognise the need to place downward pressure on the environmental impacts of, of aircraft uh, activities, continuing success of Scotland's airports brings with it significant economic benefits to an, area's an airport's local area, its wider region and to Scotland as a whole, so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, However, uh, and I've been hearing, listening uh, closely to members today, uh, I very much respect the view of, of members and colleagues across the chamber who are concerned with emissions and hope we can all agree that uh, with the success that comes from uh, growing airport activity, there's a wider responsibility for airports to consider the communities around them and particularly those directly impacted by the activities. Uh, Gil Patterson, Rona Mackay, Neil Finlay, Jeremy Balfour and Mark Ruskell all members, I think, have, have mentioned this point that they, they expect airports to act responsibly and to take into account the impact on local community. And it is important to remember that there is already a regime in place to mitigate the impact of noise from airports, with every major airport required to have in place measures to mitigate the impact of noise. The Environmental Noise Scotland Regulations 2006 require that major airports produce a strategic noise map and a noise action plan setting out how they plan to mitigate the impact of noise from the airport. There is a requirement under the regulations for an airport to use all reasonable endeavours to take the actions set out in their action plan. And it's important to stress that these action plans are themselves required to be updated at least every five years. And Glasgow Airport updated their plan last year to cover the period 2018 to 2023. And as I understand it, Glasgow Airport's plan was produced based on extensive feedback gathered during a 13-week public consultation between January and April of 2018. And this represented an opportunity for the public to have their say in what the airport is doing to specifically mitigate against noise. And it's worth highlighting that uh, given Mr. Patterson's and others' uh, concerns that Glasgow Airport are taking further measures under their noise action plan to mitigate noise for residents. And this uh, includes, uh, firstly, developing a noise insulation policy to mitigate noise for residents most affected by aircraft noise. And clearly, the move by UK government will aid those, those efforts. Secondly, incentivising the use of, uh, use of quieter aircraft through differential landing charges. Uh, Mr Finlay is though right to, to indicate that in, in future electric planes may well play a, a role in helping reduce aircraft noise and indeed they're already being trialled in Norway so they're not, as he, as he said, they're not perhaps as far away as people may think from being uh, used commercially. And encouraging aircraft, uh, thirdly, to, to adopt continuous descent operations which involve aircraft, aircraft maintaining a steady state of approach which reduces noise. And fourthly, developing an airspace uh, change proposal, which will allow aircraft to fly more accurately along uh, departure routes and minimising the number of people affected by aircraft noise. It should be noted, though, that the regulations do not just cover airports, they also cover major roads and railways, as well as major urban areas. And this recognises the need to address, as previously stated, the fact that noise comes from multiple sources. But colleagues are right that airports take action, should take action where they can do so. Uh, certainly, uh, it was touched, touched upon by Mr Finlay and Mr Balfour in their exchange, and indeed by Mr Ruskell as well, that we're very much conscious that changes in flight paths uh, can mean that, well, some communities can become less impacted by aircraft noise, others can see aircraft noise increase. And while airspace change is a reserved matter, as has been said by a number of colleagues, uh, which is the responsibility of UK ministers and UK Parliament, and the Scottish Government has no direct uh, formal role in the process, we have emphasised previously the need for airports to properly consult local communities. That's a point I think Mr Finlay was very much concerned to make sure that happens and, and with sincerity that those consultations are genuine um, and that in, indeed in relation to their proposals. And I make that point here again today uh, that that is something we expect to see happen. And at present, large parts of our airspace are crowded and inefficient. This is bad for passengers, clearly, but it's bad for the environment and bad for the wider economy. So it's perhaps obvious, but I should restate that Using our airspace more efficiently can lessen the need for things like aircraft stacking, thereby making journeys quicker, using less fuel, uh, meaning a cut in emissions and hopefully less noise over those communities closest to the airports. However, it's also important that, ne that necessary changes are made to the use of our airspace to accommodate future growth in a sustainable way. It's also essential, however, that airports effectively consult with local communities and, and take account of the responses to that consultation before deciding on which options to pursue as part of an airspace change process. But finally, presiding officer, in conclusion, the mitigation of the impact of noise from an airport must be balanced against the benefits that an airport brings in terms of economic growth, employment and so forth. The Environmental Noise Scotland Regulations 2006 impose requirements on airport operators to take action in relation to noise. I was greatly heartened to hear about the, the impact that individual uh, measures can be taken and my colleague Kevin Stewart was keen to emphasise that he will be looking at the uh, protection against noise in his review of building standards uh, for uh, 
I, I will. Neil Finlay. Does, does the Minister believe that there is a contradiction in the uh, view that you can have uh, sustainability and exponential growth in aviation? Minister. I, th I think um, I would agree in the way that Mr Finlay has put it, but I certainly recognise we have to get the balance right. We have to, if we are growing air, air traffic in Scotland, we have a responsibility to communities that are affected and also uh, to make sure we manage the, the greenhouse gas emissions that arise from, from air traffic. So clearly with technology improving, we can see more efficient engines, we can see quieter engines, we can see indeed entirely new uh, propulsion systems in terms of electric uh, planes. So it's not necessarily a given that the air travel has to be bad for the environment. We can obviously try and design out those vulnerabilities in future. But I take his point, I know it is a tension in policy and that's why we reflect uh, the impact of emissions in our annual uh, statutory uh, greenhouse gas emission targets. Um, but I do want to just point, point to the fact Mr. Mr. Stewart was keen to emphasise that we will be looking at the issue that was raised by Mr. Patterson of how we can uh, make the most of energy efficiency investments to try and uh, tackle noise, noise uh, impacts on residents in terms of the review of building standards. And uh, Mr. Stewart, before he had to leave, asked me just to make that point to members in the chamber. So uh, we, we obviously have, have work to, to do in this respect, but we believe that the requirements of these regulations are for now sufficient, obviously um, uh, augmented by the, the steps taken by UK government and uh, they do uh, meet their intended purpose, but there are no plans for, for arrangements to be changed at this time. But I have certainly taken extensive notes of the points we made by members and I will make sure my colleague Mr Matheson is aware of the strength of feeling across the chamber and report that back. Uh, well, it has to be brief. I mean, uh, I'm, I've, I'm I've, quite I've happy the, because sure. there's a few, just a few speakers. Mr. Ruskell. Thank the member for giving way. Um, will the Scottish Government consider taking back control, if you like, of Edinburgh Airport and actually designating it as an airport which is under the control of Scottish Ministers? Wouldn't that be the most strategic thing to do, given that Scottish Government has an, a balanced interest in aviation? Minister. I hope, I hope the member will forgive me as I'm not the lead minister on that particular topic. That I will, I will relay that point to Mr Matheson and ask him to correspond with uh, Mr Ruskell, but I've certainly noted it. It's uh, not within uh, my, my, my side of the portfolio, but I will certainly relate that to, to Mr Matheson and uh, make sure that uh, he's aware of Mr Ruskell's point. But on that, presiding officer, I, I conclude and thank you for your patience. Not at all. Interesting debate. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.